Hello, my name's Michaela Nuttall and I'm a trustee from POTS UK and I'm also a parent of somebody with POTS and I am delighted that you can join us here today uh, to ask some questions to you, Dr Phil Fisher. Uh, but before we start to ask you some questions uh, from our members, I'd like you to, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, sure, Michaela, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I'm a pediatrician at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota in the States and I have the privilege of taking care of lots of kids, teenagers that have POTS. So it's all right if I just jump in with our first question. It's fine with me. Let's go for it. Okay, so the first one, and it seems to have been quite a common one that comes through, is can you, are you born with POTS? Is it hereditary? Nobody really understands the genetics of POTS, but I don't think anybody's born with it because they don't have any sign of having it when they're younger. But there's some sort of a genetic predisposition. Some families have multiple people with POTS. Many families have nobody with POTS in them. And there's some racial difference about POTS. So I think there's a genetic predisposition, but POTS doesn't usually start until the early teenage years. So they haven't had it smoldering along, but it comes on later on and around the beginning of teenage time. So that leads on to my second question, um, which, which you've almost started to cover, is POTS and puberty. It seems to come on quite a lot there, but is there other times as well that it might start? So for teenagers, what I deal with as a pediatrician, it's usually in the early puberty years, at the beginning of adolescence. Adult women, more than men, also can get POTS, and that's said to be a middle age thing, 30 to 50 years of age. And I think that adolescent onset POTS is a little different than adult onset POTS, because it usually comes on related to the hormonal change times of life. It's usually in the real high achieving teenagers, and often they've had an illness or an injury first. So something predisposed them, genetically, the time of life, the hormones, something about their body composition, and then something happens that triggers them to fall into having POTS. We've also had quite a few questions in coming about when POTS starts. Now it does seem that it starts a lot in puberty, um, but are there any other causes as well? So typical for the patients I see, since I'm a pediatrician, it starts in the early part of the adolescent puberty time of life. Um, it also happens though in adults. Teenagers, it's about two-thirds girls, one-third boys. For the adult POTS, it's almost always women, 90% or so of cases, and that's usually in 30 to 50-year-olds that develop POTS then. But POTS does, for the patients I see, usually start towards the early side of the adolescent teenage years. Also, when people are diagnosed with POTS, is there other conditions that they're often found to have at the same time, whether we've been asked about EDS, Tourette's, Lyme disease even? So. Yeah, I look at it as partly the predisposition, partly the triggers for POTS, and then po partly the consequences that come after. So for the predisposition, it's something genetic that goes on that makes some families more likely to have kids that way. There's something about the biochemistry of a person, I think. It's the high achievers that get POTS. It's not the slouchy people. It's the high achievers that get good grades that are involved in ex It's every parent's dream, the kind of children we want to raise. So there's something about their body that's keyed up to really succeed in life. So something genetic, something about the body chemistry of a high achiever, and then there's something about the hormones coming on in early puberty. Those are kind of the predisposing things. We also see that POTS is more common in stretchier body people, the hypermobile people, whether they have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or they're just extra stretchy. But a majority of the patients I see with POTS have hypermobility, not necessarily to the disease or diagnosis way, but something about loose bodies with, smooth, with soft connective tissues are the ones that are going to have more trouble when their blood vessels, blood tubes get swollen out and don't stay tight. So those are kind of the predisposing pieces. And then there's often a trigger. A trigger can be anything that lays them up for a few days. So it's commonly something like what in the States we call mono, mononucleosis here. I think you call that glandular, glandular fever. fever. Yeah. Uh, so there's something about an illness that's usually got a high fever with it more than an average little cold. But it's often an illness that triggers. It can be an injury like a concussion that triggers it. So I've seen POTS come after all sorts of infections. In the States, it's often after mono. I saw an American living in New Guinea that got it after malaria. I've seen people that were living in Africa that got it after brucellosis or schistosomiasis. We saw a lot after the bad influenza epidemic we had several years ago. And some people have gotten it after Lyme disease or anything else. But those triggers seem to come, trigger the infection, have the infection, trigger the POTS to start, and then the infection's gone, and then they've got POTS. Then there are the consequences. So often people with POTS have got something else going on. 
20 to 30 percent have some sort of a mood issue with anxiety or depression. I'm surprised it's not more. If I felt as bad as my patients, I'd be a lot more depressed. Um, but I think there's something about the POTS chemicals that are off balance that also affects the mind. So yeah, patients with POTS often have a lot of diagnoses, whether it's partly the POTS symptoms, their headache or their intestinal problems, or their dizziness that we could call a separate diagnosis, or whether we're diagnosing the triggering piece or the hypermobility they had with it. So it's pretty complicated, but yeah, patients with POTS come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and they're individuals and they've got a lot going on. A very topical thing for us at the moment in the UK and, I, and I'm sure in, in many other countries is the HPV vaccine. Um, I'd really appreciate your thoughts on that one, please. I think first we have to remember that the HPV vaccine saves lives. It prevents a lot of cancer in women. Um, so there's an important value in people being vaccinated. The people that get POTS are often people that are in the early puberty years, and it's more common in girls than boys. And in America, we give the HPV vaccine to 11 and 12 year old girls. So we're giving it to people right before they might be developing POTS. We've looked through America, we've examined the literature of the world. I was part of a World Health Organization group to study all of this, and we found no evidence that the HPV vaccine actually triggers or causes POTS to happen. But coincidentally, some people that get the HPV vaccine when they're 11 or 12 then develop POTS when they're 12 or 13, and you could wonder if it caused something, but they're no more likely to get POTS if they got the vaccine or didn't get the vaccine. So as best as we know, for populations and groups of people, it's not a risk factor for developing POTS, but we can never say what happens in individuals necessarily. Phil, I'd like to ask you a sort of probably a really personal question as a parent and about my daughter and her diagnosis, because she did indeed have the HPV vaccine. Um, but she also had glandular fever. She also had a big kidney infection, palinophritis, was in hospital for a week. Um, and then she lost, you know, three girls in her school, died unfortunately over a period of a few years. And after all of that, um, we ended up with a diagnosis of POTS and Earl's Dan loss. As a parent, I spend a lot of time trying to worry about, is there something I could have done differently, something I could have prevented? Um, and I work hard at trying to look to the future and trying to change things for her. I, I really value your, your thoughts and opinions on, on our experience. As a pediatrician, I find the parents that blame themselves are usually the good parents. So the fact that you blame yourself tells me that it wasn't your fault. Um, but that's amazing. Your daughter went through a lot. She had a lot of really bad things happening at a very fragile point in time. And maybe something of that was the trigger, and we'll never know what actually triggered the POTS. Um, based on what we know, I would think it was more likely the pyelonephritis in the week in the hospital or the glandular fever. Not likely it was the vaccine or the stresses that she was going through, but those are all miserable things to go through. But the triggers of POTS disappear after they've triggered it. So what we really need to focus on is what you said, how can we help her get better? And there's no sign that she had any untreated infection, assuming they took care of the pyelonephritis in the hospital. So we've taken care of the triggers. We will never know what was the real trigger and exactly what happened and why it happened. But there's nothing in the story to make me think that you could have or should have done anything differently. And instead we get to realize, good, she got the diagnosis. Now we know what to do. We can deal with it and she can move toward recovery. Thank you. <laughs> Phil, we're going to have a really specific question for you around neurological issues now. Are neurotransmitters involved in POTS? I think so. I think that's the core of what the problem really is. But we don't know what all the neurotransmitters are. Some of them are the adrenaline sorts of things that do the fight or flight reflex. And some of the manifestations of POTS are blood flow related and heart rate related. Some of the neurotransmitters involved are probably like serotonin. Serotonin is a neurotransmitter that does a lot for how quickly the intestines move food through and how digestion happens. And we know serotonin also affects the activation in the brain for anxiety and depression. I think the main problem of POTS is an imbalance of the neurotransmitters. We all have conflicting neurotransmitters that we have to keep in balance, not too much of one or too much of another, and keeping that right balance for blood flow with the alpha receptors and the beta receptors. We have all these different neurotransmitters working, and the problem of POTS is they're out of balance, and so they're not working smoothly together. So I think it is a neurotransmitter issue. A really serious question for, that will come from a lot of people now, and they really value your answer, but it's really looking at prognosis. And how many patients, we've often heard that paediatric cases that children will grow out of POTS, how many do, what percentage do? 
I think almost everybody does. By data that we know, it's probably at least 90%. And I think it's probably even more than that. I can't say the outlook is so good for somebody that develops POTS when they're 50 years old, but for the adolescents that get POTS, almost all of them outgrow their POTS. And so I give people optimism. I let them know they're gonna do fine. We've surveyed our own patients two to 10 years after we've seen them. And we've looked at hundreds of them and realized they recover, they get better, they go on to university, they go on to get jobs, they get married, they have lives, uh, and they do well. So I want people to be optimistic that they can get better. And diagnosis in children, um, particularly those in a younger age, with that raised heart rate of 50 beats a minute, uh, the tilt table, give me your thoughts on it. I like the tilt table test because it's formal, it's standardized, and we know we can have some confidence in it. Um, and we have them available where I am. POTS was initially described by using a tilt table test. When we're not gonna use a tilt table test, we're just gonna have someone lie down and relax and then stand up. But that's not always standardized. Did they lie down long enough? Did they rest enough? Were they nervous? Were they talking? Were they moving around? So if we could standardize the standing test, then we could have more confidence in it. So I think it has value, but we need a little more research to know just how to do the standing test. So the tilt test is the gold standard. That's the best answer for now. But when it's not available, having somebody lie down, flat, calm, on their back, totally relaxed, and then checking the pulse is good. And then if they stand up still like a statue for at least three to five minutes, and check the pulse again, that pulse change from the standing to the resting um, should be accurate. We just don't know how perfectly accurate it is. I'd like to spend a few minutes now on the non-pharmacological management, so the lifestyle, really, which I think many of us believe is totally key for the, for the management of POTS. So um, a lot of parents and actually patients with POTS would like to know which of the lifestyle interventions should they try first, which is the most effective, what, what's going to be better for them and their children? Everybody with POTS is an individual, so we need to customize care. But even so, almost everybody with POTS does well with the lifestyle interventions. We need to do that, and we can't do it piecemeal. We have to do everything. So we need to build the blood volume, and we need to get the muscles working better. To build the blood volume, we need to increase fluid and salt intake. Fluid intake fills the blood volume, but it's going to run away through the kidneys if we don't give extra salt to hold on to the fluid. So the fluid and salt have to work together. Exercise is vitally important because we need to tone up all of our muscles. We need to get the heart in shape, we need to get the muscles in shape, and we need to teach the nerves how to tighten up the blood vessels so blood will flow uphill better against gravity. So the fluid and salt intake and the exercise are vitally important, and I don't think we can separate saying we need one more or the others. But when I ask my patients that have gotten better, I say, why are you better? They'll often say, exercise, exercise, exercise. I don't know why they say it three times, but I think they believe it. Uh, but there's something about exercise that's critical. But I wouldn't just say, let's try one and then see if we need to add the other. They need the fluid and salt intake, and they need the aerobic reconditioning exercise. And I would actually put cognitive behavioral therapy, the mind over body strategies, as a lifestyle sort of thing. It's something that people can do as they learn how to change the way they think, which can change what their body does. We say that POTS is a problem of the autonomic or involuntary nervous system. Involuntary implies that we can't control it, and yet our minds are pretty clever, and our minds can control our involuntary nervous system to some degree. Biofeedback's a standard thing some psychologists and physical therapists train their patients to do. So I would lump all of the lifestyle things together. People need to drink more fluid and eat more salt. They need to get aerobic exercise, and they need to make sure their mind is working well to help control their body. But I'd also suggest they need it in the context of a balanced life. They need to make sure they're getting enough sleep and having regular meals and dealing with the stresses of life. I have teenagers, I say, what are the stresses in your life? And they say, I don't have any, life's fine. I can't imagine anything more stressful than being a teenager, and they're just used to it. We need to make sure we're managing that. So I would lump all the lifestyle things together, fluid and salt for blood volume, exercise to recondition the nervous and circulatory systems and the muscles, and then all the mind over body things, and doing it in the context of a regular daily schedule, doing normal things, and making sure we've got some rhythms and patterns with eat and sleep. 
Now, a lot of POTS patients, uh, in fact, all POTS patients are told to eat more salt, yet our public health messages that we have in the UK and around the world is salt is bad for us because it puts our blood pressure up. So is there any worry that if our POTS patients eat more salt will cause long-term damage? The reason salt leads to high blood pressure is the reason it helps patients with POTS because the salt holds on to fluid and builds blood volume. For a healthy person, that's just going to hold on to more fluid, which means the fluid in the blood system is under higher pressure. So that's high blood pressure. So I'll tell my POTS patients they need more salt for now. But by the time they get off to university, they're going to have to break that habit of extra salt so they don't get high blood pressure when they're older. For people that get POTS as adults, it might be different. But when they've got POTS and they're symptomatic and they're dizzy, they still probably need salt. But for the teenagers, they need that fluid. They need a lot of salt, a lot of salt. And then they need to break the salt habit later on in life so they don't get high blood pressure later on. Now a question uh, from, the, from the, the girls and the women and the ladies uh, here. Symptoms often get much worse before menstruation. Is there any advice you could sympathy. give? Sympathy, I have a lot of sympathy. Uh, I feel for them. Typically for my female patients, I find that their symptoms are a lot worse during the time of their periods, and their periods tend to be a lot worse than other people. Um, so the times of periods, they need to really push the fluids and salt because their body is shifting how fluid flows. So they need to have even extra fluid and extra salt around times of periods. They need to ma manage their pain because pain triggers all those nerve transmitters that are out of balance. And then many of my patients end up on hormones to regulate their periods or even to skip periods for a couple months at a time. And that helps the POT symptoms stay settled down. Some of my, my fellow parents, um, are parents of very young children with POTS, and I have to say it's, it's very heartbreaking. My daughter was 15 when she was first diagnosed, but, but I've come across parents now whose children are eight and seven. Um, what advice would you give to them? Because obviously there's a lot of medication they can't take, um, and they've yet to hit puberty. So that's a challenge for me. The youngest person I've seen with POTS has been a nine-year-old, but she'd already been menstruating. Um, I had more sympathy for her too. Uh, but it'd be very unusual for POTS to actually develop very far before periods start for a girl. So if I hear of seven-year-olds with POTS, I doubt the diagnosis a bit. So I'd have to check out these individuals. There are other people that have tummy aches and dizziness and tiredness and have other things going on that might not be POTS. But I'm a little suspect of a diagnosis of POTS when the POTS is diagnosed more than a few months before periods have started for a girl or before the growth spurt starts for a boy. And I'd want to make sure we're not missing something else. So, Phil, it's great to hear that, that many adolescents will grow out of POTS as they get older. But can you give us an idea of how long that might take? Um, I think many of us think it's going to be a couple of weeks or a couple of months. Um, I wish I could predict, but somehow I didn't learn that trick along the way. And it's hard to say because some people I've seen start functioning well and do well within months. Usually it's a matter of a few years. I warn people that most by the end of the teenage years should be doing better, but I've had some that drag on into their mid-twenties. But they can pretty well be assured that they're going to function a lot better and be able to live life and recover function along the way and then eventually recover and be cured of their POTS later on. But they're in for the long haul. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's going to take some long-term commitment and long-term patience with a lot of ups and downs along the way. And we hear a lot about pacing and you have to just, you know, take it nice and easy. Um, but a lot of teenagers are boom and bust and want to just, when they have a little bit of energy, go and do stuff that they really, really enjoy. Would you advocate that they do the stuff they enjoy and then have a little bust or or what? What would you go for? I'm not convinced that overdoing it damages their body, but it might make it psychologically more difficult if they keep having crashes and having a lot of trouble. So we need to moderate. If they don't push themselves some, they're not going to get better as quickly. If they overdo it, then they're going to be worse. So we need to be moderate about how we do it. I think we should schedule our fluids and salt in our school and our activities, and we should schedule our exercise but that's the schedule for what we want to do and need to do. And if they want to go do something fun and exercise more or do something different, that's okay as well. But it might lay them up and be tired for a day or so, but they shouldn't cut back on their baseline normal exercise. Um, so they should be graded and paced by plan, 
but they shouldn't alter that part of the plan based on how they're feeling that day because they need to persevere through it. But if they want to stay up late one night realizing they're going to have a bad day the next day because there's something big going on at school they want to be up for, that's okay. Uh, but we want to usually have moderation so they don't push themselves and then fall and have that post-exertional malaise, that tiredness after doing more that gets a lot of people down physically and psychologically. So moderation is good, paced plan, but not all the ups and downs and swings of an irregular schedule. We've had quite a few questions come in around symptoms now, so I'm going to take a few moments to ask you a variety of those. Um, the first one uh, is, is the feeling of heart, the heart rate and feeling it bouncing and bounding and the pain that comes along with that. And is there anything that they can do to help reduce that? The best thing to do for that is to get over having POTS. So everything we're talking about with fluids and salt and exercise, medicines if we need them, that'll help that symptom. People that get POTS have been very bright, very high achievers before they got POTS, and sometimes that turns inward and they become hypersensitive to what their body is doing. So sometimes we need to tell them to focus more on their function rather than on their physical feelings. Because if they keep thinking about their heart rate and the pounding in their chest, then their heart's gonna pound more. Um, so if it's bothering them too much, sure they need more fluid, they need more salt, they'll keep exercising. But if the heart rate is bothering them a lot, sometimes the cognitive behavioral therapy can help. They can learn to control their heart rate to some degree and get it down, and so it's not felt as much. And they can focus on other things about what they're doing so they're not thinking so much about how bad their body feels. Can a heart that beats so fast, so often, actually damage your heart? No. As far as I know, we're not born with a specific number of heartbeats to use up before we die, and there's no damage. In fact, it's a healthiness of the heart that makes it beat that fast. When the blood's puddled in the legs, the heart's beating fast to make sure that the blood that does circulate keeps going around to supply the brain. So it's a healthy response of the heart in view of the unhealthy blood flow that leaves the blood puddled in the abdomen and in the legs, and it's not gonna hurt the heart by beating that fast. So nothing to worry about, and we can be thankful that the heart responded that well to keep the blood going up to the head. A lot of people also seem to have problems with um, concentration and the sort of the cognitive ability. Um, is there anything that people can do to help that? That's one of the toughest ones. Um, I don't know of a great medicine and I don't know of great techniques to be able to overcome what some call brain fog or cloudy headedness. That's a real tough one, but we know a little bit about that. People that get POTS were high achievers and very bright, and then they feel like they're slow and they can't remember and they can't think. When we do testing about their knowledge and intelligence and processing, they have normal cognition. So I don't know if it's because they dropped down to just being normal or if their brain is perceiving troubles even though they're still doing just as well as everybody else. So for one thing I think we can do, we can reassure them. Their brain still works, they're not damaged, they still have intelligence, the brain is going to be fine. The other thing we've learned a lot, not just from POTS patients but also from chronic fatigue patients. People with fatigue, whether it's from POTS or anything else, do not multitask very well. Their brain is activated in a way that makes it difficult to do two things at once. And I don't mean two complicated things, but even studying and listening to music don't go well together. So we advise our patients with POTS that when they're studying, just study. No distracting noise in the background, no music, no phone sitting near them wondering what the phone is saying or who's about to call. We really need to focus on one thing and then we can do it well. With the blood flow changes and the neurotransmitter changes, the brain needs to focus. And it still can, it can still function well, but we need to tell people not to multitask, to focus on one thing at a time. And that means regulating the environment and focusing on priorities and schedules. And then they can find that they can actually do well, but they might not feel like they're doing well, but they can do okay, even though they still feel cloudy headed. And sadly, that cloudy-headed brain fog is one of the latest symptoms that seems to get better. It'd be nice if we could get it better sooner and we just haven't figured out a way. Do you think the brain fog is almost one of the symptoms that you might see sooner and we don't realise it's happening? And I'm asking that on a personal point. So one of the first things that we noticed in our daughter was that her grades started to slip at school before that she probably had the bigger physical symptoms. Interesting. 
That's not what we see in most of our patients. Um, so usually the brain fog comes on after or with everything else. But that doesn't mean it's always that way. Every patient's an individual. And your daughter sounds to have been very high achieving. And it could be that she was pushing through so well with this months long period of lots of big challenges and stresses to her body. It could be that she didn't realize how much she was suffering until she looked back. So the grades could have been a sign of that. Um, so yes, it certainly is possible. Um, but it's tough. We look back and we're not just sure what made everything happen that way. Um, okay, I'd like to ask you a little bit now about pain. Um, a lot of patients seem to report a lot of pain and different sorts of pain, whether it is um, tingling, all different ones. Uh, what do you think about pain and POTS? Most of our patients with POTS have pain. And it doesn't surprise me because the same nerve transmitters, the same nerve chemicals that are out of balance with POTS are the nerve chemicals that transmit pain messages. Um, so I'm expecting that people are going to have pain. And the treatment is similar. We still need to make sure we're supporting blood flow, we're getting exercise, we're having a regular schedule, and we're getting enough sleep. Um, and that can help the pain as well. But then the cognitive behavioral therapy can really help us not focus on the pain and responding to the pain, but functioning well in spite of the pain as we get through it. And of course, sometimes medications are even needed. We've had one person that's submitted a question that said actually after, well with their POTS, they occasionally bang their legs and find that they get a lot of bruises and some swelling. And should they be worried about that? And is there something else it might be? Or is it the POTS, do you think? Lots of patients with POTS are hypermobile. Lots of them have stretchier soft tissues. Um, so they're the ones that might be bruising more easily separate from the POTS. So people with POTS should not bruise more than usual. My patients that bruise a lot with POTS is probably because they have fragile capillaries and fragile soft tissues from their hypermobility or Ehlers-Danlos or whatever else. But the swelling is related to blood flow. So to get swollen in the legs when they're upright, to have the hands get swollen and bluish when they're standing up with the hands down, that's potsiness. That's the blood that's just not flowing very well. And how about vertigo and POTS? We have a lot of patients that have vertigo, nausea, and, and all that makes you feel even worse when you're standing up. I guess I'm thankful for that because it reminds me that I'm not very smart as a doctor. In theory, by doctor definitions, people with pot should have dizziness or lightheadedness and they should not have vertigo. Vertigo is that sense that the room is spinning around the person. Dizziness of pots is the person is unstable in the room. Um, vertigo comes from inner ear problems. It's a totally different thing than the blood flow problems of pots. But patients' bodies don't know how smart I am because obviously I'm not that smart. And some POTS patients really do get vertigo and they feel like the room's spinning. When they do, I want to make sure we're not missing anything else, either a nerve problem from their ear nerves that control that or maybe some different thing that's going on. I've had some patients with POTS that get migraine headaches without the headache, but they just get vertigo from it. Um, but yes, some patients with POTS do get vertigo. That would prompt me as a doctor to make sure we're not missing an inner ear problem. But the treatment, if we don't find any inner ear problem, is still going to be to take care of the POTS and then the vertigo goes away too. Another specific question somebody's written in saying about their daughter has lots of, their body has lots of jerky movements and their GP has prescribed diazepam, uh, which has helped the jerky movements but is making, making their daughter very, very sleepy during the day. People advise? that are functioning well with POTS don't usually seem to have that. So I think that's a sign of more severely involved patients with POTS. Sometimes the jerkiness is more of just a little tremor, a shakiness. That usually goes with deconditioning. Some of the bigger jerkier movements just seem to be because the total body is just getting confused. It's this nerve function, the networking that's off. It's not from the nerves being broken, but it's they're just not communicating well with each other. So when we see that jerkiness, that can be a real problem, but getting physical therapy and exercise going helps. And a lot of the patients can be helped by the psychologist that's very good with cognitive behavioral therapy because people can train their brains to make that jerkiness stop. I had a patient that had been through five weeks of inpatient rehabilitation, and during that time she progressed from a, a walker to a wheelchair, and her legs were just too jerky and shaky to be able to walk. She came and saw us, and within two days she was running and jumping and dancing and fine. 
I don't understand why. Um, she says it was not psychologic at all, except that we believed in her. I'm not sure how believing in her wasn't some cycle, but something magical happened, and it happened with the physical therapist who got her to believe that she could walk. We believed in her, she believed in herself, and her legs started working better. Um, so there are a whole bunch of different things. Sometimes it's the shakiness. Of course, we'd make sure that the electrolytes and salts are okay and there's nothing different um, going on. But usually if we get the pots doing better and keep the mind strong, that jerkiness and shakiness can go away. Some people look like they're having seizures. Some people with POTS do have seizures and it's a separate sort of thing. But usually the seizures are not from the brain going on, but it's a disconnect between the brain and the body. And that can again be helped with some good cognitive behavioral therapy. Not because it's a psychological problem, but because the body is not communicating with itself very well. And that's why we need to restore function of the neurologic system. Lots of people with POTS get very, very scared, particularly when they have a flare-up, so when they've got lots of pain, tingling, blurred vision, and absolutely when the, when the blurriness finishes and calms down, they end up really sometimes quite confused, enough to not even remember their daughter's name. Is, is this normal? Is this part of POTS? Is it normal for POTS? It's scary, and it looks dangerous to people that don't see a lot of patients with POTS, but we see it fairly commonly and it's not medically dangerous. So socially I feel for people going through that, but we can reassure them once we make sure that it's not a seizure disorder, it's not something else, which only rarely would it be. We can reassure these patients that it's okay and we can help them get back in control of their symptoms. For teenagers, it's a challenge because we care about our patients, their parents care, their peers care, and when they look like they're forgetting things and lying on the floor shaking, having a terrible spell, everybody wants to give them attention and help them out, and sometimes that feeds into the spell lasting longer. So we need to focus on normal function rather than getting distracted by all these dysfunctional things the body's doing. Supplements. Iron, vitamin D, and vitamin B12. Tell us what we've got to do. People with POTS need good nutrition. We need to support the body. Nearly half of our POTS patients that I see are low on iron. So we need to do the ferritin blood test to see what their iron status is. And if we give them more iron, it helps them. They get more energy, it helps their mitochondria, the energy factories of the body work better. So iron deficiency is common. We need to look for it, and if it's there, we need to treat it. It's separate from the POTS, but it's gonna be harder to recover from POTS if somebody stays iron deficient. Vitamin D deficiency relates to pain, and we know that patients that have chronic pain are often low on vitamin D. So I think we should check vitamin D levels and then supplement if the level is low to give some. Lots of people care about vitamin B12, and there was one study from Turkey where patients, teenagers in Turkey with POTS were often vitamin B12 deficient and they needed to be supplemented. I've never seen a patient with POTS low on vitamin B12, so I've stopped looking for it much. And I'm not sure what's different, well many things are different between a Turkish diet and an American diet, um, but somehow people in Turkey were more susceptible to vitamin B12 deficiency than Americans are. So if somebody's concerned, they should check. If the B12 level is low, they can get supplements. But it hasn't been a problem as far as I know other than that one group of patients in Turkey that had the B12 deficiency. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Phil Fisher, for coming to talk to us today uh, on behalf of POTS UK and all the patients. Huge thank you. Thank you, and thanks for everything you're doing for patients with POTS here.